As we saw last week that Jacob was alone in Peniel. He had sent his family on. He had sent the livestock on. He had sent the servants on to meet Esau. And as bringing them bringing him gifts because he knew that Esau was on his way with 400 men. Jacob thought, surely he's coming to kill me. This is the end of the story. This is what it is going to be. And as he comes to this place where he is alone, the pre-incarnate Christ appears, obviously veiled, but nonetheless a man And as he wrestles with him all night long, Jacob learning that he cannot get out of this. He has no strength. He has no possibility, even with a hip that has been dislocated simply by the touch uh, on his hip. And he is named, renamed Israel. Meaning God prevails. God is conquered. But as he comes and understands that he needs the blessing, that even with a dislocated hip, which is severely painful, he says, I am not going to let you go till you bless me. I will not let you go till you bless me. We even looked at the woman who's Canaanite woman in Jesus' time, whose daughter was had a demon going crazy. She had no hope but in Jesus. And Jesus ignored her. And she was desperate and she even went around Jesus and she got on her knees and and said, my Lord, you're it. And he says, but this is for the children of Israel. I have come and should I give bread to the dogs when I bought bread for the children? To which she even said, yes, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs. And Jesus said, no greater faith. How we need to be desperate for God. Not for anything but for God. And so he meets, he comes now and he meets Esau under these circumstances. And in this chapter, yes, Jacob is going to be changed in many ways. But here's where you'll go. Jacob, wow, you've really changed. And then the next verse, Jacob, you've not changed at all. And then the next verse, wow, Jacob, you've really changed. And then the next verse, nope, not so much. And that's you and I. That's exactly our sanctification in life. There are many things that when we are in Christ, we are changed. But then there are those times every day in our life, not so much. Because we did not yield to God. And God is taking us through a journey And that God is the author and finisher of that journey in your own life. You can look at your past. You can look at everything you've done. And boy, you've had some doozies. And you've really messed it up. With your own temper, your own anger. You just, there were times that some of you, maybe you were just angry all the time. And still, There's days, even now, that that anger just boils up and comes out even though you're a believer and you've trusted God. But you just, you think the only way to deal with things is just be angry. And there are other things, sexual temptations that are constant throughout Scripture. There are uh, things of jealousy that you are a jealous person, but that jealousy just rears its ugly head up and you're jealous again because your life is never as good as someone else's life. You look at other people and you want their life and you're, listen, your struggle is not with those people whom God has blessed materially more than you perhaps. They look happy and they have more. They have more going for it. I wish I had. And the murmuring begins Your struggle was not with them. Who is it? Your struggle is with God. The struggle becomes with God. And it's always something that is there. As one author said, we as believers, we do not so easily want to cling to sin anymore. 
But as we'll see in Romans 7, but ah, how sin so easily clings to us. We have an inner desire. I want to love God. I want to serve God. I want to do all of these things. I want to stop complaining. I want to stop gossiping. I want to stop being angry. I have this great desire for all these things. But then there's something at war within my soul that just overtakes me on certain days. And so Jacob comes with this back and forth, with this sanctification. But he's about to come to meet his brother Esau. He does not know if he's going to meet a peaceful man or if he's coming to meet his executioner. Because what Jacob had done, remember, what Laban had done to Jacob and Jacob's response, and Laban constantly manipulating and constantly lying and doing all of these things to Jacob. But now Jacob here is confronting a situation into which it was his fault. He, he got the birthright. He got all of the inheritance from Esau, the, his twin brother. And then over a bowl of stew. And then he tricked his father Isaac and dressing like Esau, smelling like Esau. And Esau knew this. And you remember 20 years ago, what was the reaction of Esau when he was in that room with his father after he had found out that Jacob had stolen the covenant blessing, which was Jacob's to begin with. And Jacob didn't need to steal. He needed to sit back and watch God fulfill his promise. It was already prophesied that the older would serve the younger. Jacob being the younger twin brother coming out second, the heel grabber. But nonetheless, Esau walks in realizing that the covenant blessing of God had been stolen. And what did Esau do? He wept. He cried. He was on the floor, as it were, heaving in tears and saying, isn't there a blessing for me? And he rose up and he was so angry. And he said, I will kill him. That was 20 years ago. Now he's meeting the brother in whom he had caused such tremendous pain. And just so you know, Esau does not love God. The birthright that he wanted and the covenant blessing he wanted was all from a fleshly, unsaved, selfish way in which he wanted to apprehend all the blessing but it was given over to Jacob. And so this meeting happens. And so we're going to look at number one, Jacob's posture. Jacob's posture before Esau. He knows that Esau is now coming. Jacob is caught up to his family. He, de he then puts his family in an order. In an order from, I guess you could say, the least loved to the most loved. All the servants and the, servant, the, the two servants that... At the behest of his wives wanting more children, they would give just like Abraham with Sarah with Abraham, giving the servants over. Now they're going to be your wives and they're going to have more children. We want children, more children, more children. Jacob had been pushed and pushed and pushed, but he puts the servant wives up first with their children. And then he puts Leah and then his most loved at the very back, the most protected would be Rachel and Joseph and Rachel and whom he loved and whom he wanted to marry in the first place if it weren't for Laban switching on that wedding night. So where does Jacob then go? Now, the old Jacob, here's what he would have done. He would have been behind Rachel and Joseph. But no, now something changed. This is where he changed. He then is in front of all the family. And as he walks toward Esau, the family is behind him. He's going to engage Esau himself. Something had changed. While Esau was afar off, Jacob begins to bow to the ground. Now remember, he just had a dislocated hip. I don't know if it popped back into place or not, but he's limping and he's in pain. And somebody with a bad hip having to bow down each time he's doing it, in pain each time. And as I was reading John Calvin's commentary on this, it seems that Esau was still afar off, but Jacob is bowing even before Esau gets to him. 
And there's this, rever- there's this reverence that is going on that he's bowing seven times, which was typically reserved for a king of high honor. But Calvin says he believes that he was actually praying and that he was actually worshiping God before he actually met Esau, before Esau could even see him and that God was with him and that he's gaining the strength by worshiping God, remembering God each step that he takes closer to Esau. But he was also showing humiliation toward his brother. He knows he's confronting. And I don't know if you've ever walked into a room. Have you? Maybe you haven't. Maybe you have. You ever wronged somebody so much? And you, it's your fault. You wronged them. What is it like whether you get in the car or you're about to walk into to the room where those people are sitting? I don't know about you. I've had that situation. And it's as if... My heart is in my tongue. I I am so nervous. My tongue goes numb. My heart rate is going faster. High blood pressure because I have no idea how this is going to go. Some of you have had minor cases and some of you have had more severe, but you can imagine the nervousness of Jacob. Yes, he's a man. Even though God said, I am with you. Even though God says, I have blessed you and you've heard the blessing over and over and over. He's still a man of flesh and blood. He's still afraid. And I would be too. (laughs) But he bows before him. Because of this betrayal that he had caused. This could be the day that he dies and goes to meet God, thinking as a man. This could be it. What does the pain of the sword feel like in my stomach or across my chest? What does it feel like to die today? What will happen to all my family, thinking as a man? What's going to become of this? But as he got closer, something interesting happened. Esau ran to meet Jacob and he embraced him. He hugged him and he kissed him because this was his twin brother. This was the one in whom he was a part of the family. 20 years had gone by and he hugged him and he held him close and he kissed him and they wept in each other's arms. Not only had Jacob changed over this 20 years, but Esau had to. And Jacob is, I imagine, filled with relief. Esau is glad to see his brother again. Esau inquires then of Jacob's family. We see in verses 1 through 7. And then he looks over, and after they had reunited in this emotional reunification as brothers, Jacob looks and says, who are these? Inquiring about his family. It's interesting what Jacob says. The children that in this home, it is the one that God has graciously given to your servant. It is not by my might, but it was God's graciousness that I have this livestock, that I have the family, and that I have the children. It has all been God's graciousness because he's looking back at the time of Laban and he said, if it wasn't for God, none of this would have happened. None of this would be here. It is all God's graciousness. How often we, we tend to brag of our own successes and we have nothing to brag about. Do you have a good business? It is all of God. As Paul said, what have I that God did not give me? What thing do I have that God did not graciously bestow upon me? I don't have it. I don't even have breath. The reason I'm breathing right now is because of God's graciousness. And Jacob looks at Esau and says, look what God has blessed me with. And look how he has blessed me. And Jacob is reversing that role because he knew he took so many things from 
from Esau that now he says, I am your servant. I bow before you because of what I have done. I humble myself in front of you for what I have done. Instead of waiting on God and letting God do his work in his time and blessing me with covenant and blessing me with birthright in God's timing, I ransacked it. I stole it. I manipulated because I wanted it all and I won. Jacob had done this all his life. But now he looks back and his language has changed. His posture has changed. He is now in front of the family. His words have changed. I am your servant. The posture of bowing, yes, before God, but also before him, knowing that what he had done, because he was a man coming to meet the consequences, because he simply did not love and wait on God. I wonder if there are things in your life that you could look at and saying, ah, you know why that happened? Because I didn't wait on God. I, I just, I had to get it done and I had to do it my way and I had to hurry up and do it my way. And because I did not wait on the Lord, because I did not seek his face first, I, I suffer consequences to this day. Just because we're forgiven of sin doesn't mean that we continue to have to deal with the consequences of our sin. Oh, forgiven, but there are consequences. And Jacob is seeing that. And so one of the most important things we see here is that Jacob's posture before God, God had prepared Jacob for this meeting to go down. Again, and I just want to reiterate, I will repeat like a good teacher in school. I will repeat because many times the students can zone out and then I do the same thing at times and then you come back to this. But Jacob's real struggle was with God and placing his faith in him who was able to fulfill all his covenant promises before him. Jacob needs to, he will have to continue to learn this lesson that God is the one who fulfills. Jacob can't steal it. Jacob can't maneuver it. Jacob can't do anything. God has to do it all. Just like in our salvation, it is God who accomplished your salvation. You accomplished zilch. You accomplished nothing. God saved you by His grace. God chose you and elected you, as Ephesians says and Romans 9 says, because God was gracious and merciful to you. You did nothing. Yes, but wait, I responded in faith. But even the faith that you have, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, says that faith was a gift given to you by God. So that not even you can look at your own faith and saying, I mustered enough faith to come alive in Christ. No, you did not. Dead is dead. You were dead in the trespasses of sin. And God enlivened you. God is the one who awoken you. John chapter 3, when the Spirit of God comes and He regenerates you and resurrects you and makes you alive, then you look up and you see Jesus and Him crucified. We ought to be on our knees like Jacob. We ought to be bowing before God and saying, I don't understand how you could be so good to me and so gracious because every day of my life, I struggle that if you're faithful or not, God, by my own murmuring, by my own attitude, by my own fear, by my own anxiety. And every day I know this, that's my sin that I've got to deal with because in doing those things, here is what I'm saying. God, you're just not faithful enough. You're just not faithful enough. Why this in my life? Why that in my life? Why this in my life? Oh, yeah, you put them there. And it seems that everywhere I turn, there's another thing going on. There's an Esau. There's a Laban. There's an anxiety. There's a temptation. And yet you have been faithful. Because we only see the present. And here's what we so rarely do. We rarely look at the past and say, oh man, when I see how faithful you were to me in the past, 
every single circumstance. You have been so faithful. And yet, I continue to complain about everything today. I'm mad because so-and-so didn't do this or so-and-so did that. Or the... Stop. We need to stop. And we need to start stop looking at people. Oh my goodness, if you live for people just doing what you want to do, you are in your own kind of hell on this earth. But when somebody begins to stop it, and they begin to say, I will not do this. I'm not going to play this old record in my mind anymore. I am going to look to God who made heaven and earth. He is faithful. He is more faithful than my wife. He is more faithful than my kids. He is more faithful than my parents. He is more. There is nobody like God on earth. Except the one who came, Jesus Christ. And so when you put that kind of thing on other people, you begin to set up a weakness in your own life into which you will always just be filled with anxiety and you will always be mad and you will always be murmuring and you will always be not content and you will always find something that's always wrong. And God is saying, stop. Look unto me. The one who has been faithful to your soul. This is where Jacob is. God weakens Jacob's body as Jacob now has a limp. Strong Jacob, now weak. He couldn't even put up a fight if he tried. Jacob was tired, lame, and scared. I wonder if that ever describes you. I know it does me. Tired, lame, and scared. So often, Jacob could not. Jacob couldn't do. He could absolutely do nothing. But you know what? That's the exact position God wanted him in. It's exactly where He wanted him. Absolute dependence upon Him. When we realize there is no strength, no words, we come to that position that it was always the way it was supposed to be. It's in God's hands. I know there are some that protest in our mind. Yeah, but we got to do our part. You can't just let go and let God. You got to get in there and you got to. Well, I don't know what you mean by that sometimes when people say that. It sounds like you're still arguing with God in one sense. Because there's an obvious you need to do your part. I mean, that comes with an obvious. That you need to be kind and you need to be loving. And if you need to correct, you do it in love. And if you need to tell the truth, you do it in love. You do all of these things. That's not absent. But I'm talking about before you go, you don't get to go without asking God to give you strength in the right spirit in which to do it. And this is how Jacob approaches Esau. He's trying to do it in the right spirit. And I know many scholars could say, well, Jacob was giving in and Jacob shouldn't have been. I, I really over and over reading this chapter, Jacob knows his sin. Yes, his life is on the line, but he also know that he betrayed and he's trying to have the right. He's met with God. He's wrestled with God. All of these things. He's dependent upon God because he has nothing. He doesn't have the words, the right words. He doesn't have the strength to even fight if he could. He's in that position to where he's bowing. I believe along with Calvin that he's bowing before God and saying, this is all in your hands, Lord. Every bit of it. Either that or we're all slaughtered. And some said that he put Rachel and Joseph at the very end for in case they could run away. Nobody's running away. They'll catch up to you. You could. How far is a woman with her child going to run after she figures out everything's gone wrong? Not far. This could be a slaughterhouse, but it doesn't. And Jacob is greatly relieved. But this is Jacob's posture before Esau in whom he has wronged. And it is also his posture before God and whom he has wronged. But God has been gracious. God has met with him. God has wrestled with him. God brought the struggle. God has said, I will make you so weak 
that all you have is to depend on me. How gracious of God. Number two, Jacob's persuasion. In verses 8 through 11, Esau sees all these presents. Esau looks at Jacob in verses 8 through 11. He goes, I, I, you know, the whole way, there's, there's a flock here. And they're saying, who are you? We're Jacob's servant, and he's giving you this flock as a, as a present. He moves on. He gets a little further toward Jacob. And there's another flock. And the same thing over and over and over. And Esau going, what are you doing? Why are you sending drove after drove after drove? And Esau's wondering why all the gifts came his way. And he said, why have you done this? And Jacob said that he wanted to find favor in his sight. But Esau said something interesting. After seeing all the animals and all the flock, he did not accept it. And he goes, Jacob, I have enough. I have enough. I will tell you, if you remember back when Esau comes into the tent after Jacob had, uh, had ran and Esau is in there realizing that the covenant blessing is, is gone. Isaac did say to him, you will enjoy the fat of the earth. You will enjoy the dew sent from heaven. That is true. But it was a, a blessing in this way, but that's all you get. Now Esau had been tremendously blessed and probably what Jacob had was small compared to what he had. You got to remember, 400 men, most of them probably had a wife or multiple wives, as was the culture in there. They probably had multiple children. There were probably more servants and more men back at the camp. He had tremendous amount of livestock to feed an army, and there was a couple of thousand people. He had become the king of a nation. And Jacob is offering what he would look at as, it's so small, Jacob, compared to what I have. I have enough. You'll notice that when Jacob, every time he says, this is how God, gracious God has been to me, notice Jacob Esau's language. He never mentions God at all. He says that I have enough. There are people who are wealthy, and we could actually, I think some people in America actually say, I have so much I need to get rid of. I don't need anything else. I need to start downsizing. I want to get rid of some stuff. It's too much. That is certainly, wow, a blessing from God. Such abundance that we live in. Then there are people who can just never have enough. They, they get some money or they get a house or they, and it's always, they, they've got to take the next step up. They can never be and truly fulfill what the scripture says. Be content with what God has given you. Oh no, oh no, that's not enough. I, I wish, when you get that new shiny thing, you wish you had the newer shiny thing. And if that newer shiny thing comes along, you wish you had that and it just never ever ends because you can't be content with what you have. You never have enough. You could have a billion dollars and you know what? You'll wish you had 10 because that's the nature of your heart. Now, not everybody is like that. There are some people that says, I have enough. In fact, I have so much and they're very gracious. They could even be unsaved. I've seen unsaved people do it better than a lot of Christians. I have so much. I need, I have the opportunity now to help other people and to give to other people. I have enough. Now, the abundance that I get, I want to help other people that are in need. And certainly, that is a graciousness that is reflected of God, especially when a believer does that. There is another part in which Esau says, I have enough because this is all he gets. He will not, he does not have the covenant blessing. He does not have the birthright blessing. He does not have the, all that God had offered. Why? Because he scowled at what God had and what God was going to give. He didn't want it. He, he, looked at it with contempt. I like what Spurgeon said here. Esau says, I have enough. Yet he had lost his birthright. He had all the blessings of the covenant. 
He had lost his birthright. He had lost all the blessings of the covenant. He had lost all part and lot in God and goodness. And I hear this part, what Spurgeon says, it is an awful contentment when a man can be satisfied without God. What a terrible peace is that when a man is, is in a peaceful state of mind, although he is unsaved. You know people like that? They are at peace. Listen, you look at them, they're happy. They're happy with all that they've got. They've got the fat of the earth. They experience the dew of, of, from heaven and all the beauty of nature, and they've got a lot, and they've got enough, but they do not have God. And yet a poor man can sit over here and saying, I can barely scrape by to pay for groceries, and I'm just paying my bills, if that. And I'm just getting this, but you know what? I have Jesus Christ, and I have all the blessings that are in there in Romans 8 and Ephesians 1 and all through Scripture. I have the blessing of God. I have the forgiveness of God. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and God has accounted me as righteous. That is, if you take away everything from my life, that is everything that I need. I have not something. I don't just have enough. I have all of creation that I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ with. And they believe that. They don't look at it as a far off and saying, it said, but I'm really not content because I don't see it yet. Oh no, they're saying it by faith. Mm. They believe it. They didn't just hear it. They actually believe it. But he says, I have enough. Whereas Esau could have said, no, God has graciously blessed me, Jacob. God has given me an abundance, but he doesn't. He says it like a, a man that says, I had to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And I made a lot of good decisions, and I did this, and I did it. I, I am so wealthy, I have enough. But Jacob nonetheless insisted that he takes the gifts, because he said, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God. Uh, what does he mean? There's times if you would have to see the face of God, what are you experiencing? The wrath of God. But then there are those like us that sees the face of God in Jesus Christ and we find forgiveness and we find mercy and we find restoration. We find adoption because Jacob's heart is so glad. When I thought I was coming to meet my death, I found life. And that's for Jacob. It's like, it's like seeing the face of God with you. You're not going to kill me. You hugged me. You kissed me. You inquired about my family. You have blessed me. But the cultural standard was not accepting gifts from an enemy. And so in this culture, and by the way, it's still true in some cultures, to, to say, no, 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 thank you, though. I appreciate it, but no, no, thank you. You keep it for yourself. No, you go to many cultures, that's an absolute insult when somebody is trying to give you a gift. Only an enemy would refuse the gift that you're giving them. And so they would, they, in Romania, if you, if you don't take the gift in which they give and they've saved up for a long time and you don't take that gift, they will ask you, how have I offended you? that you would not receive my gift. It's not like in America, no, no, I don't need that, but thank you anyways. No, when you accept the gift in, in a place like Romania or other countries, or even during this time, you are saying, thank you for your gift. We are friends. We are connected. And that's why Jacob was insisting, because Esau, if he re continues to refuse the gift, what is Esau saying? Jacob, you're still my enemy. But then Esau comes to that point at Jacob's insistence, and Esau takes the gift that, at Jacob's insistence. Number three, Jacob's proposal. And in this proposal, in verses 12 through 16, in this Esau wanted to take Jacob to Edom with him. Back down south, if you look at Israel, Esau's outside the promised land, on more toward the east coast, but as he or toward the east, but as he comes down to Edom, he wants Jacob to come with him. 
And Jacob, in his proposal, said no. He goes, listen, now this is Jacob's lie, all right? We see some things that are happening. Jacob is saying, wow, he really is trusting God. He went ahead of the family. He spoke truth that God has been gracious to him. And then Jacob goes, whoop, in that same instant, he goes right back to his old flesh. And he goes, no, 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 you go on ahead, Esau. Uh, We'll follow behind because, you know, my children, they're really tired. And if I walk my livestock one more day, they're all going to die. It was an absolute lie. It was an absolute excuse. You know, kind of like the excuses we give. Maybe somebody invites you over and you're like, ah, yeah, just figure it out on my count. You know what? We got something going on. You had nothing going on. And all the little excuses, and they call them white lies. It's just a lie. And it's deception. And this is what Jacob is doing. He's going back to his lies and deception because he does not want to go with Esau. Thought. Probably because he doesn't want to get himself back into a situation just like he did with Laban. The other thing is, no, I need to get in the promised land. I don't have time to go with you all the way down there. It's not going to work this way. But he knew that he did not want to challenge Esau because he did not know what Esau's reaction would be. So Esau says, all right, then I'll tell you what, I'll leave some of my men with you and then They'll come with you down to Edom, down to Seir, where I am. And he goes, listen, he says, my Lord, do you consider me a worthy servant? Then let me just, what need is there, my Lord? If I have found favor in your sight, in other words, do you trust me? And then Esau said, fine, and he left to go back to Seir. Jacob had no intention of following Esau. But Jacob went back over the the little creek or the little river that you could wade through called Jabok. And he actually goes backwards over there and he goes back to the place and he starts to travel onward toward the west. And he comes to a place called Sukkoth. And it was actually a little more north. It was way north and west of where Esau was. And Jacob gets there. Number four, we see that Jacob's purchase and Jacob begins to wander to Shechem. And Jacob is not setting his heart on Bethel. And you'll see in chapter 35, God actually comes to him and says, you belong in Bethel. That's where you were supposed to go. Not Shechem, not Sukkoth. You were supposed to travel by those and get down to Bethel. This is where you need to be. But Jacob, the oh no, Jacob, not again scenario comes up. And Jacob begins to go to Shechem. And he has his heart not set on Bethel. And he settles in this area, building himself a house, building himself tents, building himself booths. And there he purchased, just before the city of Shechem, he purchased the land from the sons of Hamor and pitched his tent right there. It reminds me, it reminds me so much of what Lot did. When Lot, uh, herdsmen, and, and Abraham's herdsmen began to conflict, and Abraham came to him in humility and says, you choose whatever land you want, and I'll take the other. This is Abraham. Abraham could have said, nope, this is what you're getting. But Abraham came in humility and he said, you choose and you go over here and I'll go over here. Then it winds up that Lot is camping in front of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then eventually what happens? He's a part of the city. In fact, he's on one of the lead councils at the city gate, one of the elders at the city gate. It would take a little encroaching at a time. And you see there that he is before and he is becoming a part of this society. And by the way, he would have been there between five to eight years. He wasn't stopping to pitch his tent so that he could move, take a rest and move toward Bethel. No, he encamped there in a place that he should have never been. He knew he shouldn't go with Esau, and that was right. But he should have not have lied to Esau. He knew that he should move on into the promised land and he was right. But he was wrong in where he camped and put a permanent dwelling. But nonetheless, it's interesting. Sometimes between our flesh and our faith, it's a struggle. Back and forth, because we're here worshiping today. But there are many decisions that we made this week that were not of God. 
They had nothing to do with it. It was just the way you wanted it and you were going to get your way. And there were things that you watched and there were things that you heard and there were places that you've been perhaps. It is not where God would have you. But nonetheless, yet you are here worshiping in faith today. You see the duality. We're schizophrenic. <laughs> we just always go back and forth like a ping pong ball. Just dun the dun the dun the dun and people are watching our lives and it's as if they're watching a tennis match on, on television and their heads are going back and forth. It's dizzying to us sometimes how quickly we wander away from God. Nonetheless, he builds an altar and there he erected a place of worship and he called it El Elohe Israel, which is God. God to provide, God to conquer, God the provider. His grandfather, Abraham, had erected an altar there when he first came. If you remember Shechem, Shechem would become a famous place because when Abraham's first coming over, years and years before, he's first coming over, he comes into the land of Canaan. It's the first altar he builds right there at Shechem. And the way the, Greek, the, way the Hebrew makes it sound as if Jacob is repairing or continuing to work to build that altar to God, what his grandfather had started. And he builds this place to show even those in Shechem, in the city of Shechem, and the princes of Shechem, and all around, we worship the Lord God of heaven. We are different from the culture. We are different from all that is around us. But yet, even building that altar, we will see next week in chapter 35, even in building that altar, what happens? His family, his kids become entangled and they become culturalized and they become sympathetic to the paganistic city that is in front of them. We have got to be so careful, especially if you have young kids. Be careful where you go and where you spend your time what you're allowing your kids to watch in a culture like a, how much paganism and how much of a paganistic culture are we even exposing our kids to and calling it just getting along. How often people go to churches and here's what they want to have. I speak to my family member, a family member of some, who goes to a large Southern Baptist church and the only thing he could, he's very committed to the Lord, but the only conclusion he can come to, he goes, is that people want to hear from the pastor. They, they want this compromise. And here's what they want. He said, even in our church, which is a couple thousand people, here's what they want to hear. Let us know how to love Jesus and live at the world, in the world at the same time so that the two can be at peace. How can I love Jesus and be committed to Jesus and yet put my little tippy toes over the line of Shechem and be involved in that at the same time? Is there a way that we can compromise? After all, I have to live in this world. I don't want to be too much different. There's a lot of good things that this world has. There's a lot of things that this world is doing. And I want to at least have my cake and eat it too. Can I have Jesus and can I have the lust of the world at the same time? I'll leave you to figure that out as the Spirit of God probably touches on every scenario in your heart. How am I trying to compromise in following Christ, in considering myself dead to sin, alive unto Christ, but at the same time saying, but can't I enjoy the lust of this world at the same time? Hmm. That's a deep, deep good question. And you will see next week the price that Jacob and his family they pay dearly for the decision that Jacob made to stay there. And he pays dearly most of all with his daughter, his own daughter, and then his sons and their reaction and what they do to the people of this city. And Jacob at the end of it is just holding his head and you can hear him saying, what have I done? How did I get here? How did this get to be this way? I should have I should have never settled here. I should have moved on. And none of this would have ever happened if I just known that this isn't the place for me. 
And it could be the place of my mind. It could be the place of my heart. And it all starts there. What do I want out of this life? You want more money? Is that what we're asking for? Do you want more stuff? Do, what is it that you want? Because I would tell you this, and especially the older you get, you begin to realize there's the life I want, and then there's the life I have. And they don't look anything alike. There's the life I want. Listen. And there's the life that God has given me. And it don't match up. And at some point in maturity as a Christian, I say, I need to get rid of that thought, those vain thoughts of the life that I want, and I need to live in the life that God has given me. And walk by faith in that. Because that thing that I want is just lust. It's just vain glory. It's all about me. It's all about all that I want. And what makes me happy? We always think that way. Does this make me happy? Then I don't want it. If it doesn't make me happy, it needs to be gone. But then there's this life that says, oh no, 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 I have to get rid of that. This is the life that God has given me. Oh man, there can be a settling of a heart when somebody finally comes by faith to realize this. There's a settling of the heart saying, I know I didn't get what I, oh, I wanted it, but God has stripped it away from me. And young people, I will tell you this, you may not see it now, and you may be very ignorant of it now as I was when I was young. You may be very ignorant right now, but I will tell you this you're not going to get the life that you imagine. You're never going to get it. And if I'm wrong, please come back 20 years later and tell me. But you're not going to get it. You need to accept the life that God has given you by faith. You do not live according to your pleasure, but you live at the one, for the pleasure of the one who is your Lord and King. Do not be deceived. So an ending. Number one, you'll see there are some, some, some conclusions, that applications that we need to understand from this passage. That we are schizophrenic or dual personalities or I don't forget all the clinical names, but there's more than one personality in us. Because living by flesh and by faith, and we exchange them on a moment, you may even get up from your pew today and you may engage somebody in here in a conversation and you could walk back and get in your car. I don't know if this ever happened to you. You walk back and get in your car and go, why did I do that? I went straight there. After, after hearing God's word, after applying and I was in that, I was sunk deep into it and I went right back to the flesh. Happens all the time, doesn't it? We're just going back and forth because we live in this flesh, but yet we desire to live by faith. We, like Jacob, struggle between the world of flesh and faith in God and his promises. There is always, let me say this, and you know this, and you know this, there is always in a reality, there is always a war that is within us as believers. To not quench the Holy Spirit but to yield to him, to not yield to the flesh, but to yield to the very spirit of God that is within us. No more lying, no more anger, no more, no more manipulation and trying to get it. Stop. That's flesh because you want a life like Jacob. I want it my way. And God is saying, no, no, no. I will take all of that from you. This is the life that I have given you. This is the life that I expect you to depend on and walk by faith in me and not according to the flesh. But I love what Paul says in Romans 7, verse 21 to the end of the chapter. In conclusion, he says, so I find that there's this law that when I want to do right, evil is right at hand. Just right there waiting. No, oh, Lord, I love you. Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to live godly in Christ Jesus. And you get up and there's evil thoughts, temptations that are lying at hand. 
For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. I do. I love the Lord. I'm so grateful that he sent his only begotten son. Now I delight in your word and in your law, O Lord, in my inner being. But then I see in my members another law that is waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. I am so, you can hear the frustration of Paul. I am so frustrated with who I am. I, I, as you grow in Christ, you will be more frustrated with yourself than with anybody else. You will first look to yourself as you grow in Christ and you will say, why is it that I keep doing these stupid, ungodly things or thinking it or saying it out loud? Why do I do this? Because you love God with all your heart. You really do and you're in Christ, but you're still struggling with a sin that wants to wreck you. And that's why he came to the conclusion. I love this conclusion. Wretched man that I am. Hey, listen, if Paul's saying it, you could say it. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And therefore, he comes to Romans 8. Now, remember, he comes to Romans 8, 1, and he says, and by the way, even though you struggle with that sin, and even though you have this inner desire, but it's not fleshing it out like you want to because the inside is growing while the outside is decaying. He goes, you need to remember this and all of this. There is therefore now no condemnation. He does not hold it against you. He is gracious towards you. He, if you're thinking today, great, then he'll just kind of wink at my sin. Oh, believer, he disciplines. He will take you behind his shed and give you a whooping. He's not going to let you be condemned along with the rest of this world. But he also understands the true believer, the true believer that says, oh, how I want to love you and live for you. But oh God, I'm frustrated with my sin. I'm frustrated with who I am by nature. Oh God, help me. Help me in my unbelief. Oh, that God looks at that and says, I hold none of that against you. And I will help you. And I will walk you through this. Calvin says, says this in his commentary, so much more ought every one of us to be suspicious of himself, lest he should deem himself perfectly pure because he intends to act rightly. For the flesh ever mingles itself with our holy purposes and many faults and corruptions steal in upon us. But God deals kindly with us and does not impute faults of this kind to us. How beautifully put. Number two, living by fear. That's living in flesh and faith. But then there's living by fear and faith. The fear of man, as Proverbs says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord, what? Is safe. It's interesting. What are you afraid of in this life? And a lot of people are just afraid of their shadows. So many things going on. What are you afraid of? What is it? Does your fear come out in anger and you're just mad? You, you, you get fearful. You just, you know, you have two modes. You're either mad or you're happy. If you're sick, you're mad. If you're fearful, you're mad. If you're depressed, you're mad. If it, it's like you just have two modes, angry and happy, fearful and happy. All of these things that go on. And yet when somebody really begins to trust the Lord and they just finally give it up to the Lord and saying, it's not my burden to carry anymore. It belongs to him. I have said the truth. I have done everything that I possibly could without interfering in what God is doing. I have prayed and prayed and prayed. He is at work. I will continue to pray and he will do the work because I live by faith and not by fear of how the situation is going to come out like Jacob. Number three, lastly, living in folly and in faith. It was folly, it was foolishness that he would camp at Shechem in the world. 
like Lot with Sodom and Gomorrah. He had his tippy toes and he said, I can have God and I can have all the covenant blessings, but I can also have the richness of safety and feeling safe. I'm in a city and to feel the safety of knowing that there's food here and all of our needs are met, not given a care about how it would affect his kids, not given a care about how it would affect his own faith. Over and over again, Jacob struggles in the flesh to live and understands God's covenant promises over him. And once again, we see that he's continuing to forge his own path by himself and setting up his family life near a sinful city when his path all the while was to go to Bethel. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. and Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make straight your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In other words, I have, I, I, we, I have plans today, but my plans could be interrupted and I could die of a heart attack today and nothing else happens. Other things can happen in which all your plan, you trust the Lord with all your heart as you move forward, but you don't lean on your own understanding. Your own understanding is, I think it should be this way, Lord. And the Lord says, yeah, that's never going to happen. It's going to be this way. You're not going to get that. You can cry. You can yell. You can pound a table. You could do all that you normally do, but it's not going to make it happen because the Lord says, no, this is your life that I have given you. Walk by faith in it. That is adultery. That is, is, is idolatry. That is a life that I will never give you. But I have blessed you with this one. And I will grow you and I will make you into the image of my son and how I have given you. Make your plans, but I will alter them. Do your thing and sometimes it'll get done, but many times it will be complicated, but I'm working through that for this is the life that I have given you. So we see next week the consequences of when we forge ahead with our own plans. Because we did not trust in the Lord. We leaned upon our own understanding. We did not acknowledge him. The one who can make our path straight is constantly acknowledging him, saying, you have put Esau in my face, Lord. You have put Laban in my life, Lord. You have put all of these things in my life, Lord. You brought the struggle. huh? And I thought I was wrestling with everybody else. And it was you all along, Lord. You have been doing this and you have been saying you are weak. Trust me, because when you are weak, you are strong. So I would say lastly, to the one who is content in this world without God, if that is you like Esau, you have not yet come to Christ. You have not yet placed your faith in the only one that can save you and give you eternal life. You have not placed your faith in the one who bled and died on the cross and went to the cross for all who would believe on him. He died and he killed the very sin and he took the wrath of God so that those who believe in him would never taste not even a a teeny taste, not even an ounce of God's wrath upon their life. Christ took it all for those who believe, but for those who do not believe. But you're content in this world. Spurgeon says this in a sermon, there is no real contentment, a truly, a truly awakened man until, until he is at peace with God. And it is a horrible thing for any man to be perfectly satisfied while he is under God's wrath and in the danger of eternal destruction, as he certainly is unless he has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to put a few, and I love this part, I would like to put a few very sharp thorns in your pillow of any easygoing people here who are content content outside of Christ. I would even wound you that you may come to Christ for healing and smite you that you may resort to the great physician 
for the care which he alone can work. For it is a dreadful thing that you should be at ease when you have such grave cause to be disquieted in your soul. Do not be at ease. Know this. You can have it all in this world, but if you do not have Christ, you have lost everything. And if you have Christ and you have lost everything, you still have all because of Christ. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your word. Speak to us, Lord. We have laid it out here, Lord. We have laid it out with Esau, who was an unsaved man, and had a, he has enough, but he gave no thanks to you. He would only be blessed with the fat of this world and the dew of heaven, but that's all he gets what was in this life. He was perfectly content with that, but even today, he is in hell. Constant torment because of his rejection of you above all. And yet there is Jacob, Lord, and we see Jacob and we see the duality that is going on here even after his wrestle with Christ. Even at the God man, after that wrestle and his hip dislocated, we see Jacob going back and forth, back and forth, much like us, Lord, even today, back and forth. Lord, I pray that you would deal with us in our own hearts. Lord, to be submissive to your spirit. We know, Lord, that we live in a body of flesh and you are so loving and gracious toward us because you know we live in a body of flesh and we struggle with sin. Hebrews 12. We struggle with our sin, Lord. The inner part of us says, oh, I love you, Lord, and I want to live for you, and I want to, I, I just want to make life that where it's all Jesus that is coming, and I want to make your name known and glorify you in all that I do, and then we find ourselves in that same struggle, Lord. We didn't say it right, we didn't do it right, but we thank you for your graciousness. That if we do confess our sin, you are the one who is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. That even though we live in a duality sometimes of our own heart and minds, we know this, that adultery no longer defines me, Lord. Being a thief no longer defines me. Being all those sinful things no, it no longer defines me. Oh, it may try to find its ugly way out of me, but it's apart from me because I have been made new in Christ and you have given me a new name. You have given me a new identity and my identity is Jesus Christ. Lord, may we rest in that. May we believe in that. And for all those who have not yet believed in Christ today, may they never be content May they sleep on a pillow of thorns until they come to you, Father. May, they, may you bring the struggle to them of the gospel of their own sin until they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Do not let them rest. And for believers, Lord, who are trying to tippy-toe in between the world and wanting to love Jesus, but at the same time wanting all the lustful pleasures and idolatries of the world, Lord, may we be convicted. May we be convicted of that. May we step back because, Lord, you're not here to punish us. You are here to bless us in Jesus Christ. And the best thing we have is to totally depend on you and to cling to you in all of this life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.